Hi, and welcome to this beginner's guide to EQ. Apart from the volume fader, EQ is the most basic and fundamental tool available to us when mixing. But learning how to use it effectively can be a difficult and frustrating process. So I'm going to try to distill down the most important information that I wish someone had shared with me when I first started out. The desk you see here is the 72-channel Audient ASP8024 installed at the Foundry Studios in Sheffield. And the channel EQs are much like the ones I first learnt on. I'm running a stereo mix through a pair of channels which I've panned hard left and right. The EQ section above is actually split into two parts. The high and low shelving bands at the top can be switched in and out independently of the two mid bands below. And each section can be switched from the long fader path to the short fader path. So you can choose whether to record with the EQ or just apply it to the playback signal. If you're using a split console rather than an inline console like this one, or a live console, you will probably see a different arrangement with the low shelf at the bottom and the mid bands in the middle. Anyway, the shelving controls are not that dissimilar to the bass and treble tone controls found in the hi-fi amps. If I turn up the high shelving knobs, I can boost the high frequencies and make the mix sound brighter. And if I turn them down, I can make the mix sound warmer and darker. If I analyse the frequency response, we see that boosting results in a gentle upward curve towards the high frequencies. And cutting produces a symmetrical smooth downwards curve. The high shelf EQ also features a frequency selector button with a choice between 10 kHz or 18 kHz. Pressing this button shifts the boost or cut up higher, so it has less effect on the upper mid-range. But with such a gentle curve, the EQ still reaches down well below 18 kHz. In a similar manner, I can boost the low frequencies, or cut them. And I can again switch between two different turnover frequencies. Switching to the higher 100 Hz setting shifts the EQ up the scale, so it has a greater effect on the bass region, while the lower 50 Hz setting predominantly affects the sub-bass region. But again, the slope is very gentle, and 50 Hz denotes a point near the top of the curve, rather than a specific sharp cutoff. OK, let's move down to the mid bands. We have two of them, one for the lower mid-range and one for the upper mid-range. And if I turn up the gain controls, the result is a bell-shaped boost with symmetrical smooth curves above and below the centre frequency. A fully parametric EQ like this one will also provide a frequency control, so you can set the centre frequency of the bell. And also a Q or bandwidth control to set the width of the boost or cut. In this case, turning the knob down makes the bell sharper and narrower with steeper sides while turning it up results in a wider curve with a gentler gradient on either side of the centre frequency. The upper mid band is exactly the same, except the frequency knob has a different range with a lower limit of 450Hz instead of 50 and an upper limit of 20kHz instead of 1.5. This is quite a generous range for the two mid bands. 50Hz is much lower than most desk EQs will allow for the low mid band, as this is actually right down in the sub bass region. And likewise, 20 kHz is much higher than most desk EQs will allow you to set the upper mid band. Of course, while these knobs are calibrated in Hertz or kHz, unless they're set to one extreme or the other, you never really know precisely what frequency they're tuned to. And likewise, the gain knobs. I know they provide about 18 dB of gain change with a full boost or cut. But with more conservative settings, I can only guess roughly how much I'm applying. This means you have no option but to set the knobs by ear. I remember when I first started out, the only advice I got was just use your ears. But frankly, I didn't find that very helpful. Of course, what I really needed to do was to train my ears so I could recognize problems and translate them into EQ settings in much the same way that a musician needs to train their ears to recognize intervals and chords. Like learning an instrument, this is going to take time and practice but you can speed up the process with some simple exercises, which I'll come to later on. OK, so let's take a look at Pro-Q2 and see how the situation changes using a modern EQ plugin. 
This time I'm processing a stereo pair of drum room mics. And the first difference is I can use a stereo plugin to process both channels, so I don't have to match my left and right EQ settings manually. If I drag in from the right, I can create a high shelving band. And again, we see a very gentle slope, much like the high shelf on the desk. If I boost, I can increase the level of the high frequencies and make the cymbals louder and brighter. While cutting makes the cymbals quieter, making the overall sound darker and putting more emphasis on the body of the drums. Unlike the desk EQ, I can freely sweep the shelf up or down and set the frequency to any value I like. But with such a shallow, gentle slope, the precise value isn't so critical. Also, unlike the desk EQ, shelving bands in Pro-Q2 provide a Q control, which affects the shape of the slope. Turning this up towards one makes the gradient steeper, and we start to see why the shelving type is named as it is. I can go even further if needed and increase the slope setting. The higher values here can create super surgical shelves, allowing me to turn down the high splashy part of the cymbals without affecting the upper mid-range snap of the snare drum at all. But beware that these steeper shapes will usually sound more unnatural and more obviously processed, especially when boosting instead of cutting. For sweet sounding transparent changes, it's usually better to stick to the default 12 dB per octave slope. Or even the 6 dB type, which doesn't have a Q control and is fixed at a gentle gradient, much like the desk EQ. Okay, so let's double click somewhere in the middle of the graph to create a bell shaped mid band. Like the desk EQ, this has three main parameters gain to set the amount of boost or cut. Frequency to set the centre frequency of the bell, and Q to set the width. While the desk EQ is very generous with the frequency ranges provided for the mid-bands, Pro Q2 is more generous still, and mid-bands can be swept all the way down to 10 Hz, or all the way up to 30 kHz if you really need to. There is a slightly more significant difference when it comes to the Q control, however. Turning this up makes the band narrower, Unlike the equivalent knob on the desk, which makes the band wider when you turn it up. Actually, there are two different ways to define the width of a band. The desk doesn't label or calibrate the knob, but turning it up increases the width. So by implication, it's controlling band width, which is usually measured in octaves. The Q control provided in Pro-Q2 is just a different way to define band width, and it goes in the other direction. So a larger Q value denotes a narrower band with steeper sides. Another important difference, however, if I turn the bandwidth all the way down for the sharpest, narrowest possible bell on the desk and analyze the response. This is equivalent to a Q setting of around two, approximately, in Pro-Q2, nowhere near the maximum available. The extremely narrow cuts and boosts available in Pro-Q2 can be useful sometimes when you need to target individual notes or harmonics. But most of the time you won't need to go so narrow. Try around 1.5 as a good starting point when cutting. And likewise, the widest possible bell shape available on the desk EQ is nowhere near as wide as the minimum Q setting in Pro-Q2. This super wide parameter range gives us extra flexibility. But most of the time it will make sense to stick within the same kind of limits that the desk imposes. 0.7 might be a good starting point for natural sounding boosts. So, how do you know which frequencies to cut or boost? Actually, the first step should always be to listen. In this case, I'm hearing a slight boxy quality to the sound, which I'm going to go hunting for with a boost. But I don't want to create new problems that aren't really there. So I'll start with a Q around 1 and only 6 dB or so of boost. And I'll gently sweep this through the mid-range, kind of like a magnifying glass. All the while listening out for that boxy character to be exaggerated. And I'm finding this at about 500 Hz, so let's cut this region back instead. Notice that while the analyzer does show a bit of a build-up in energy around that region, there's nothing in the graph to indicate that this is a problem, 
while other obvious peaks elsewhere are not. Nor is there any massive visual difference between the foreground signal showing the processed signal and the background graph showing the original input. While the graph is certainly useful, our ears are way more sensitive, and our EQ decisions all still need to be made with our ears, not with our eyes. OK, so next questions. How deep should I cut, and how wide? Well, to an extent, these questions are related. Generally speaking, if you need to cut deeper, you may benefit from a narrower, tighter cue, so you have less effect on the wanted part of the spectrum to either side. If I enable Gain Q interaction with the button in between the knobs, I can make this happen automatically. And I can now sweep the Gain knob up and down without having to adjust the Q so much. When it comes to gauging how much cut to apply, it's important to realise that your ears will adjust themselves remarkably quickly to any frequency imbalance you're listening to. Listening to a signal with too much lower mid-range for a while, and then exaggerating that excess of lower mid-range further while hunting for the frequency to cut might mean that our ears start to get accustomed to that unbalanced sound and our corrective cut might then sound wrong as a result. A trick that can help here is to start by deliberately cutting too much then slide that frequency back in gradually and approach the target from the other direction instead. But the most important point is you can't make a final decision on this while the part is soloed. It's perfectly okay to solo channels while hunting for problem frequencies and applying basic corrective EQ. But the final settings can only really be assessed in context with the rest of the mix. I'm going to describe a scenario which may be familiar to some of you. You're balancing your mix and you want to hear more of the bass guitar, so you turn it up. Then you decide you need more electric guitar, so you turn that up as well. Then more keyboards. Now you want the drums to hit harder, so you turn those up as well. And now we're getting red lights on the master, so we pull the whole mix back down, and we've gone full circle and ended up more or less back where we started. This kind of circular mixing is frustrating enough, but there is a worse scenario still. This time we want more bass, so we solo the channel and EQ it with no regard for the rest of the mix, probably making it louder in the process so we think it sounds better. Then we solo the guitar and EQ that in isolation, and so on for the rest of the mix. This time when the mix bus starts clipping and we turn it all down again, we're not just back where we started, we've probably got something far worse. Especially if you suffer from favourite frequency syndrome and you boosted the same frequencies on all channels. This is what I call the downward spiral of mixing, and this is to be avoided at all costs. In fact, every EQ change needs to be assessed within the context of the mix, and is likely to come back and bite you if you fail to do so. But this raises another problem. As you progress through your mix and EQ each channel, the context changes, so you'll probably need to go back and reassess your earlier decision. This is perfectly normal. You shouldn't expect to be able to EQ each channel once and get the correct settings straight away, because correct settings will depend on other decisions that you have yet to make for other channels. This is something I'm going to look at in part two. Meanwhile, I'm going to leave you with some ear training exercises as promised. First, I want you to build up a library of references if you don't already have one. These should be well-produced commercial songs that you know sound good in all your usual listening environments. And they should probably include some examples in roughly the genres you work in. These mixes are going to become your reality checkers. Listen to them carefully on your studio monitors so you become intimately familiar with the way they sound. If you move to a new control room, or change your monitors, or add acoustic treatment, these mixes will help you to tune your ears to the new normality. So import these mixes into your DAW, turn down the gain to give yourself some headroom, and experiment with EQ boosts. I'm going to EQ my own mix instead to avoid any copyright issues. The idea is to become intimately familiar with the sound of each frequency band, so you can recognise when a certain region is too prominent. For example, the boomy character that results from too much 80 hertz. 
or the muddiness of too much 150. Up at around 4 or 500 hertz, we find the boxy character I cut from the drum room mics earlier. While up higher at around 800 hertz, we discover a honky nasal character. 1K5 sounds hard and edgy. While 3K is harsh and abrasive. And up at 8K, things get tinny and sibilant. The precise adjectives don't matter. You can substitute your own if you don't agree with my descriptions. The important point is that you should train your ears to recognise an excess of a certain frequency band. In much the same way that a musician will train his or her ears to recognise chords and intervals. That's all for now. Look out for part two, which will look at using EQ to create clarity and space within a mix. Thanks for watching.